This Boss Rush Spotlight is brought to you by, well, you. If you want to learn how to support the Boss Rush family of podcasts, head to BossRush.net or our Patreon at patreon.com slash BossRushMedia. Thanks for helping us build something better. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to a Boss Rush Podcast Spotlight. I am your host, Corey Deering, and alongside me for this one, none other than the mad pharmacist herself, Stephanie Klimov. Hey, happy to be here on one of my favorite kind of, we, we call this like a branch off of the Boss Rush Podcast. Yes, Boss Rush Plus, if you will. Plus. I'm excited to talk to some really awesome people. I know. I know. I'm really, I'm really excited. Also, also joining us is uh, <laughs> the hype man I tonight. I can't, <laughs> I can't even do this. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Nintendo, Mr. Mr. Way Forward, uh, that retro code Eddie V. I get to fort the way with one of the best companies <laughs> of my Here we go. gaming library. Hello, everybody. I'm just, I'm super hyped. I'm so excited to be talking to these two. And yeah, welcome, everybody. Welcome. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> um, so if you if you couldn't tell by the thumbnail or the uh, title of the episode, or I don't know if you just left YouTube on and you know, this video started playing when you woke up, welcome. Uh, we are here uh, with a developer spotlight with uh, way forward uh, you may know them from river city girls shante uh, they made a pretty awesome uh, blood rain uh, game that was that i really enjoy mighty switch force uh, among a hundred other things that you may or may not have you know you've probably played a way forward game in the last 20 years even if mm-hmm. you didn't know it uh i want to first off i want to welcome back adam tierney who was on the boss rush podcast uh before uh and then joining him is James Montagna. Hello. Hello, guys. Welcome to the show. Welcome. Yeah, welcome back, him. Adam. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we we started in Adam. This this actually this idea spawned off the po- the podcast that you were on with us. We were like, well, what if we just did a spinoff podcast where we where we spotlight uh, different developers and, and creators and stuff? And we really felt you know, just with how great you guys were with with uh, us on that show, and just how uh, great Way Forward has been directly and ind- indirectly with communities, ours included. It's just we thought we had we had to get you in this first run of of spotlight episodes, and uh, yeah, this this is this is incredible uh, that you guys are here. So why don't you tell? us a little bit about yourselves uh james we're gonna start with you since you're you're the newbie here uh out of, <laughs> out of all of us i guess uh um, sure. t- tell us a little bit about you about your role about what what you what you do at way forward and uh yeah you got it uh so hi i'm james montagna and i am director and designer here at way forward i've been working at way forward for uh 16 years now and in that time, uh, I've had the pleasure of working on very many games, uh, some of which include uh, the games in the Shantae series, uh, Mighty Switch Force, uh, Mighty Milky Way, uh, Cat Girl Without Salad. Uh, I directed a game, Vitamin Connection, on Nintendo Switch. And uh, most recently, I worked on the games Ruby Arrowfell and uh, with Nintendo. Advanced Wars One Plus Two Reboot Camp. Yeah, yeah, it's, yes, yes. Advanced Wars. Uh, <laughs> uh, Adam, you you want to tell people what you do, what you are, who you are, not what you sure. are. Sure, uh, I'm Adam. I'm another designer director here, and also recently I uh, took over um, uh, oversight on our biz dev and, and publishing at Way Forward. Um, and I've worked on a lot of the same games James has. In fact, we've actually co-directed quite a few games together. This is true. Uh, we worked on mm. uh, um, uh, Cat Girl Without Salad together. We worked on Silent Hill together. Um, 
worked on a SpongeBob game together. Um, but yeah, I've, uh, most recently I directed uh, the River City Girls game, the first one. Um, I wrote the scripts for both of them. And then I've also done some titles like our Batman game, our Flash game, our Silent Hill game, um, Till Morning's Light, an original game, Lit, an original game. Lots of the, the horror and kind of story stuff came from me. Uh, that's so uh, something something i noticed uh from from both appearances of way forward is is the longevity that you guys mm-hmm. have have been at the studio you know i i hear a lot of things within you know just by hearing other interviews and stuff that people will work on a game for you know two to five years depending on the size of the game put it on the resume and then they'll go somewhere else or and and i'm not i'm not talking about like you know uh contract work or outsourcing i'm i'm you know people at major studios you know i was uh listening to a podcast where uh rod ferguson was on uh talking about his stint with epic and then going to rational to work on bioshock and back to the coalition to work on gears and something like he he likes to ship games so that's why his resume is so in and out but i kind of i really think what makes you guys great is the longevity and just the consistency because of the longevity. And, and that's incredible. That's awesome. Yeah. You know what I'm curious about? And it's, I'm not sure if you want to, we could turn this into a question or if you just have comments about it, I would be curious to know your personal perspectives on sticking with one company and, and having that relationship for the longest time, observing how the industry changed. Cause this is still kind of like, new compared to a lot of other industries and a lot has happened in the last 16 or so years yeah i've been uh james has been here for 16 years i've been here in 19 years almost 20 um so we're real lifers and uh you know we also there's a lot of kind of lateral movement at wave forward so i came in as an animator and then i did assistant directing what was your first uh, my first gig here, I was doing uh, pixel animation. Yeah, yeah. So we both came in as art- artists and then eventually became directors. Um, but I mean, for me, you know, you definitely, I've definitely thought over the years, because you're right, like if you look at most of the, the industry, people tend to jump around every couple of years. That's much more the norm. And, you know, I think the reason we don't is for me, two things. One, um, because we're, an independent studio. We're not owned by anybody other than Voldy Way, our founder. That means we can work on anything. So we can work on any brand. We can work with any publisher. If there's any like cool anime or TV series or, or anything that we want to make a game based on, we can go and pursue that because we're not, you know, locked into like, you know, any particular group of, of licenses. So that's another one big thing. And then the other thing is just our founder owner Voldy Way is just such a delight to work with. And he's, you know, really a cheerleader of everybody who works for him. He really, you know, feeds off of like understanding what his staff wants and trying to, you know, help realize like the kind of games and sign the kind of stuff that people here want to work on. And so it's really, you know, you know, the, the brand thing is, is somewhat important, but I think for me, it's just, it's hard to picture working for anybody other than Boldy really. Yeah, I would second that. We uh, we have great management here. We have great, really talented teams here. And one of the things that keeps me here is the opportunity to keep creating cool stuff with just really wonderful people. And of course, you know, we get to work on the projects we want to do, amazing projects. And there's so few companies that uh, have the opportunities that we have here. Uh, Way Forward always feels like one of the industry's best kept secrets. Yep. And we could do both original and licensed stuff, which is really cool too. So, I mean, James and I, like with Cat Girl and, and Vitamin Connection, there's a number of like games that we created original characters. And then we'll also do stuff like uh, like River City Girls where we get to put our spin on stuff. And I think that sort of blend is so satisfying to work uh, at for a developer, um, you know, being able to not just create original stuff, but also work on all your dream brands and everything in between. So it's just, it just seems like the perfect place. And, and then, yeah, just the, you know, the, the atmosphere here, the, the bosses, everybody we work with are just really phenomenal. Like James said, it's like one of the best kept secrets in the industry. So I think that's just why we haven't really felt the need to go anywhere else. That's yeah. Oh, go ahead, Ed. Oh no, yeah, because like you guys did uh Bloodstains, Ritual of the Night with 
um, Itagaki, um, I believe that's it. Um, and it was just like for a game that started as a Kickstarter, they brought you guys in to help develop it. And you know, even you doing alien infestation on the DS for Sega, like I'm amazed on how many companies reach out to you guys and you take a take upon these projects. Even though, like you guys say, that you're the local low key secret, I think a lot of people are recognizing you for the games that you have made and going back and playing the stuff that you played. Um, like, how do you feel about some of those projects like that? Um, when people come, when companies come and reach out to you to be like, uh, can you help us develop this game? Yeah, I mean it's it's a huge honor, and it and it's kind of goes both ways. So something like Aliens, that was one where we had done Contra Four on Nintendo DS, and then Sega and Gearbox were wanting to do uh, Colonial Marines, and they wanted a handheld version. So they said, "Oh, Contra is very similar. That was really good. Let's get those guys." And so that's great when when work that we do and that we're proud of leads to other stuff. Um, but then sometimes it's the flip side. So for something like River City Girls, that was us just wanting to put our spin on the River City Ransom games and then reaching out to Arc System Works and saying, hey, here's our vision. Can we do this? And really, it's all over the place nowadays. Sometimes the opportunities come to us. Sometimes we create them. Sometimes uh, it'll just be two companies like us and another company saying, hey, let's work on something cool. What should we work on? And then thinking about it. So it really comes from just all different directions. That's true. It takes many different forms. Yeah. Yeah, because you guys working on two techno skates, uh, River City Girls and Double Dragon. Like, yep. that's that's cool. <laughs> Sorry for nerding out here, everybody. <laughs> yeah, especially it was really cool that, that when we did the River City games, Ark let us play with that whole universe. So if you play through the game, you know, you see the Lee brothers and Marion and a Bobo and, and, you know, all these characters in there from double dragon and also the lesser done stuff like combat tribes. Oh, it's like, a pretty obscure one. Yeah. Yeah. It was really, oh, combat it was, I, yeah. I, I, Super Nintendo yeah, yeah, arcade. I remember that. Anything from those old technos games. Yeah. So <laughs> not to, not to get too sidetracked here, but you know, that you, you did that, you did a double dragon game. You should, uh, Make a sequel and talk to Microsoft and get the Battletoads in there, and then we can finally have a full <laughs> circle reunion. You know? Yeah, we're big fans of Battletoads. I mean, it's a very hard game, the original, but uh, um, yeah, <sighs> we, we, almost anything. We're constantly looking at retro stuff, so almost any brand you could think of, we've probably thought about doing at some point, or maybe we have, you know, some pitch or mock up, or we wish we could do it. Um, or prototype. Yeah, in fact, that's usually like a lot of the questions are like, hey, can you tell us what would be your dream game? And a lot of times we can't really fully answer because it's like, well, we're talking about those right now with companies. Can, yeah. can, can y'all do Keith Courage in, in Alpha Zone from Turbo Graphics? I need a sequel or a remake. <laughs> <laughs> I would, I would love that. It, it is a deep cup, and I've been asking for it. And then why you guys just said that? I'm like, ooh, if Way For It could do Keith Courage in Alpha Zone and do a sequel. I I probably my son would probably would leave this world, but for, first it would buy the game and and, and beat it, and then it would leave this world. <laughs> oh man, Ed, only you could come up with like the obscure. This this is why you're here. You can come up with the obscure games that maybe only like I don't know. I maybe maybe you know maybe Way Forward would do something like that. Uh, if you want to be a Patreon producer, head on over to Patreon, patreon.com slash Media, and find out which tier is right for you. Our Patreon producers at the $5 tier or higher for this month are Adriel Munger, Austin Campbell, Celeste Roberts, Christian S., Sana Dierig, Francisco Santillan, and Rebecca Jewell. Thank you for your continued support. So... When, so okay, you you've been at Way Forward for for as long as you guys have. It. Is it has it was this? I guess I want to know how your career started. Was it at Way Forward or was it kind of where did you get your start? Like how like you both came in as animators. How, where did you guys get your start at? So incidentally, Way Forward is the first company I've worked at professionally, and I've just been here ever since. I was hired at WayForward out of college. Before oh, wow. then, I was just creating, uh, 
I guess you could call it just indie games or solo experiments and uploading them onto the internet uh, for free for people to download. Um, I was like, uh, I think I was 20 years old and uh, I had an opportunity to show some prototypes I made to WayForward company president Voldy Way because my class at college did a tour of the studio. And from there, Ooh, uh, nice. I had an opportunity to do an internship and uh, it, uh, the rest is history, I guess. So that's how I got started. The Way Forward is actually the, the first company for me. How about wow. you? Nice. That's awesome. Pretty, pretty close to it. So, I mean, yeah, I, I, I think uh, I graduated and then I ended up at Way Forward about four years later. So I didn't do that much. And, uh, you know, I was a teacher, substitute teacher for a little bit. I worked at Target for a little bit. I worked at a radio show for a little bit. So I tried a bunch of different stuff. Um, but I, I got into freelance uh, animation for video games. And then Matt Bozon, our creative director, and I were already friends online. And he noticed me talking about some gig that I got doing animation. And he said, oh, you do pixel animation and you're in Los Angeles, you could, you should come visit us. And so I did and ended up doing some work for them. And, uh, and then basically, like I said, went from animator to assistant director to director. And that's another thing that both James and I have in common. So Matt Bowes on our creative director, he's also the director of all the Shantae games. A lot of the directors here kind of come up underneath him and do assistant director for a project and kind of learn the ropes from him. So for me, that was uh, Sigma Star Saga, where Matt was directing it and I was assistant director. And what were, what were you? Wondering? For me, I was associate director on the Shantae games yeah. working with Matt. And so that was my opportunity to kind of learn the way that WayForward approaches things and does things. I learned so much just from... Uh, you know, sitting with Matt and seeing his philosophies on game design that um, I'm now able to kind of uh, think like Matt or think like the way forward philosophy for how we approach different things. That's mm. a, that, man. That's so, that's so great that like you have that structure of, Hey, let me, let me take you under my wing. Let me show you the ropes and then kind of, you know, maybe like the next project or two, like they get, they give it to you to work on. Like that's so, that's so cool to have a a leader like that that just allows you to do that and has the faith mm -hmm. in you to do that. And you know, that's that's something. Man, you guys just get way cooler every time I talk to you. <laughs> uh, what was what was what was the first the first games you guys worked on? Go ahead. Uh, so. Uh, when I was an animator, the very first game I animated was a Batman leapfrog game. I think it was called Batman Divide and Conquer. What? And the two animators were myself yeah. and uh, Paul Robertson, who's known for his crazy animations. Um, so the two of us were animators on that, working under Rob Buchanan, one of our directors here. Then I worked on a Looney Tunes game. And I think just kind of helped out with animation here and there before Sigma Star. And then after I did the Sigma Star with Matt, um, the first game I directed was an X-Men game on GBA. Um, and that was a lot of fun. A lot of the people I worked with on that game, we still work with to this day. Um, but yeah, the, my first couple of titles as a designer director were X-Men and then The Flash, both on GBA. You know, I still remember starting as an intern at WayForward. My first day, I walked in the door. Um, and funny, it was uh, Voldy Way, the company president, uh, greeted me at the door. And they're finding a place for me to sit. And Voldy gets like a... A bottle of Windex and like a like a paper towel to like wipe off a desk for me, and I'm like, oh. is this guy really the company president? I'm like, stop, let me do that seriously. Um, and so they sit me down, and they said, okay, so the project that you're going to be working on is Contra Four. I think my soul left my body. <laughs> <laughs> I was very excited. I, it was unreal. I'm like, you got to like pinch me. I'm dreaming, um, and. I did end up working on Contra 4 in a small way, but for me back then, I was like hyped. Um, the one thing I did on Contra 4 was I animated um, running scared human beings, like for <laughs> like set dressing in the environment. So if you see just like regular like people like running way scared, uh, I pixel animated those. So that was my contribution to Contra 4. Nice. My contribution. Ah. <laughs> I also, and I'm sorry, I'm I'm just, I'm just really big on this in any sort of career or work. The, the fact that uh, the owner um, of Way Forward is just so seems so grounded and down to earth, and 
relatable. That's impressive and very mm-hmm. rare, though I don't need to tell you that. But. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really amazing. A lot of the games that we work on really are just either Voldy, our CEO, mm-hmm. or the director is saying, oh man, it'd be cool if we got to do that. I mean, we, you know, we, we obviously need to make sure that the budget's there, but we don't like overthink it in terms of okay, well, what are the market trends and what's going to be hot in two years and yada, yada. It's mostly just like, this is my favorite anime ever. Let's make a game or, oh, this is the best uh, arcade game from the 80s. Let's let's do a remake of that. And so much of that just leads to the conversation and biz dev. And I think that pays off because if you have our directors and our lead programmers and producers really passionate about a game, then that's going to be the best quality that we can get from us. As opposed to, I think a lot of companies uh, might just kind of, you know, either work on games that maybe they're a little less passionate about or just kind of what comes to them. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, a lot of earlier way forward kind of biz dev was, was that as well. But I think when you can get a director like James really excited about something, then they're really going to push to make it the most inspired, creative, cool game possible. I got really excited when you said X Men, and all all I can think of now is if you revisit it hypothetically, if you revisited the X Men and did it in the style of the of the animated series as a yeah. brawl side scrolling brawler. I don't know is, what's is going on over there, but you guys can have that one for free. Just throwing that. Out. I would, yeah. I mean the the, the X Men game that we did it was. It was definitely learning the ropes because we were all juniors. And so it's yeah. kind of uneven and the difficulty is not great and everything, but there's a lot of good ideas in there. Like one of my favorite things was the multiple man battle where you're chasing him and he's just spawning off clones that are punching as they jump at you. There's a lot of gross, cool ideas, but yeah, I'd love to do another X-Men thing. Um, it was, yeah, especially talking about like the cartoon. I'd love to do something with like Jubilee front and center. A lot of the, the characters that were really popular in that series. Ooh. Which, yeah. which oh. was one, which was one of my, I don't know if Corey put this as one of the questions, but I was just, I was thinking, cause you guys have worked with Nintendo. Have you ever thought working with Microsoft and Sony to take one of their IPs and make a game where there's like an arcade style or something that's like it don't have to be very graphical but it's your take like you guys working on infamous you know and doing it as a two-player beat em up game like how would have you guys ever thought about that or anything or oh, yeah. you know no, we've got really good contacts at microsoft and sony so we're always talking about possibilities yeah i don't know if we've done anything that's as core to their IP as something like Advance Wars was to Nintendo, but we've definitely talked about the possibility and, you know, I, we love their brands. Like, I mean, my, my favorite, some of my favorite games of all time are the, the Ico Shadow of the Colossus, Last Guardian <laughs> series, them. and, uh, you know, that sort of stuff. I, I love that stuff. And also, you know, like, like big Konami stuff, like Metal Gear Solid, like there's a lot of stuff that I think we'd love to get our hands on one day. Yeah. I think we need to <laughs> resuscitate uh, Ed. I know. We need to revive Ed. He's, he he, he just, said, he, you I said know one he of said. my. <laughs> I know he said one of my favorite games, and uh yeah. <laughs> I, I would actually this came to my mind. I would love to see y'all take Forza Horizon and treat it like oh, the no. arcade cool. version of Outrun oh, by man. Sega. <laughs> that would be cool. That would actually be pretty neat. Be I'm cool. an old school Outrun fan, so yeah. I, I like the sound of that. <laughs> uh going back to to the the animation side of things i know sometimes a lot sometimes people say that uh pixel pixel art is uh or pixel animation is more expensive than like the th- kind of like the 2.5d animation um i i don't i don't really know how to phrase this question but like how do you guys feel about the 2.5d versus the pixel animation, because I think a lot of people kind of prefer the pixel animation. And I know sometimes when games come out, like I know Mega Man 11 got this when it was 2.5D. And I know when Shantae initially changed animation styles, like some people were kind of upset about that. But like, who cares? I think Shantae looks amazing in both graphical styles. And I'm not just saying that because you guys are here. Mm-hmm. But like... You know, I mean, what is your preference? What do you like to deal with? Is it a game by game basis or, you know, is it something that you just think would fit 
the the product better? Like what, where do you guys go? So I have some thoughts about this. I, I think uh, 2.5D like hand-drawn animation style and pixel art animation style, they're all valid. They're all wonderful. They're all great. Um, my love for them is equal. It's a, it is a game by game basis. It's like, what do we want to present to the player as an experience for this particular opportunity? Do we want something that has this vintage kind of retro feel? You're going to get that with pixel art. Um, I also tend to think that pixel art games just have a different play feel to them. There's something that they just mm-hmm. feel better when you pick up the controller and manipulate the character around, right? So um, we're at the point, uh, technology-wise, that we can make a t- conscious choice for games. Like for River City Girls, it was a very intentional choice to go for uh, pixel art. There might be other reasons for that uh, production-wise, but strictly from a creative design perspective, um, it's really about what is the feeling we want the player to feel. And it all boils down to the sensations when you play, in my opinion. I think they're all valid. I love them all. And it's just per game. Yeah, we do a little bit of everything. And in fact, I think, uh, you know, oftentimes we'll know the game we want to make and we'll be talking to the publisher and we'll say like, well, what do you prefer? Do you want pixel art or do you want high res 2D or do you want 3D or do you want some blend of it? Um, I think what might be surprising to a lot of people is if you look at every game WayForward's done in the last like 10 or 20 years, probably at this point, close to half of them are either 3D or have some 3D components. So we do a lot of 3D mm-hmm. games. We do a lot of 2D games. We do a lot of pixel games. Um, but yeah, we, we kind of just pick based on, you know, what's the best style for the game. And sometimes we'll do a hybrid. So for example, you know, on the one hand, you have something like the Mummy Demaster, where it's just pure top to bottom pixel. It's supposed to feel kind of like a like a, a, a supercharged Super Nintendo game. But then if you look at something like River City Girls and some of the old Shantae games as well, they've got pixel art for the in-game stuff, but then the portraits and the HUD and the cinematics are all very high res. Um, for me on that one, I basically wanted to do that because seeing the characters up high res and the, and the comic book cut scenes and the portraits, then you would kind of remember how they look when you're looking at them pixel, you kind of transpose those features and that personality onto them. Um, but pixel tends to be much quicker and cheaper and easier to produce generally. So we, we have, you know, we do a little bit of everything and often we'll mix between all the different styles. And yeah, like James says, it just really comes down to kind of what's the perfect approach artistically for the the game that we're trying to do. And when you guys speak of, about animation and everything, you guys have a, a board in this block for we, and you guys, guys kind of have a, a HD version of it. You know, the game Gree, um, that came out from the model studio and they coming yeah. out, but never, when you looked at that, did you, were you able to say, wow, how did they do that? Or were you like just taken away from that animation? And I know you guys probably could do it or bring that style of a boy in a blob back. But did you take a look at that and be like, this is on a whole different level and give it more appreciation because of how it was done? Because everything that they did was really hand drawn in a sense. Yeah. And it's interesting. Uh, boy in his blob, I think was the last game we did where we actually, part of it was done uh, pencil on paper. And so somewhere around here in the offices, we've got stacks of the original keyframes of the Boyan's Blob drawn in pencil. Um, About halfway through that game, we started switching over to entirely digital. But no, we constantly get inspired by other games going on. Um, You know, we'll look at something like Cuphead, where it's just absolutely gorgeous frame to frame. Mm -hmm. That definitely inspires, inspires us for that kind of stuff. Or we'll look at you know, some really gorgeous uh, indie pixel animation and that'll make us think in terms of new styles we can do and stuff like that. We're constantly, you know, getting wowed and getting inspired by by um, our peer titles. Have you, so it's keeping on a boy in his blob. I know that it was originally, well, NES, but originally on Wii. Uh, is it hard to take a game like that from you know, the Wii, which was, you know, standard definition at the time and, and up it, or do you guys kind of animate it in HD, hoping that it'll get a HD release someday and scale it down? Is that, is that something that you were considering when you made that game? I, I don't think we were considering like that far into the future. We made that on Wii. I was a designer on a boy in his blog for Wii. Uh, and we, uh, I still remember like the, the assets we were working with, we were, they were made for, you know, 
1080p Wii resolution. We we couldn't fathom eventually you'll be playing on a 4K monitor. Um, mm-hmm. But we lucked out because that style of art tends to uh, scale up well. So mm-hmm. when you play uh, the recent uh, re-releases of the Wii version of A Boy and His Blob, it's on uh, consoles now like Switch, for instance, um, it holds up pretty well and it looks pretty good. Um, I think we got lucky there because that art style just tends to scale nicely. And sometimes we do. But yeah, we when that opportunity came along, we looked at the files. And so sometimes we call them source. So like the source sure. resolution for a yeah. lot of those does tend to be a little bit uh, higher uh, resolution, a little bit larger than what finally gets shrunk down into the game. Whenever we can find that, it's really useful. And that's how we get it crisper. Um, otherwise, you know, you can, there's, there's filters within Photoshop where you can like enlarge stuff and clean it. There's filters within the game engines themselves that can, can make it, you know, we would never just kind of like, you know, take it as is from like the 480p Wii version and blow it up and it's all blurry and pixely. Right. We have tricks from either the source files or working with the files to make it look crisp and clean and take advantage of the new resolution. When it when it came out on we it was something that was to me Percy I've never seen or was never done. Like I put the game in my Wii and for ten minutes, even just moving it just moving the character around, I was like, This animation is so crisp and so smooth. I'm like, I don't think we I would I couldn't believe on how good it was. And I, I wish that game would have sold more because I used to work at Toys R Us. So when your game came in, I would snatch it before anybody could get a copy because I knew, because I knew it was going to be a game that if it sold out, there's going to come a time that people will want your game. And I'm just like, I want the first edition of this game. So seeing the boy in this blob on Wii and knowing that it was on the NES and everything, um, just and definitely you guys having a hug button and stuff. It it was something um it was literally was something amazing and it really just stood out as one of the to me one of the best games on the Wii because it it was something that it was this speaks way forward. No one can't do what they're doing in this space. And if they try, I don't think they're gonna get the love and appreciation that Way Forward uh do deserve. Because it, it was just something that was breathtaking to me oh thank you for saying that you know when that's a that's the sort of way that we can only hope to move people when we create games like a boy and his blob so um to hear that from you actually means a lot even though it's been so many years since we worked on that game have you so speaking of kind of up or or staying on that topic a little bit have you ever thought about going back to some of the older games that you guys have made and remaking them at all like you know that you guys just released uh the the original shantae on playstation platforms i think right so i mean have you ever thought about that like an anniversary edition of shantae where you go back and remake and you know make it more attuned to maybe like an original vision or you know because obviously the game boy color is very limited in scope so you know if you could make it for switch and playstation and xbox like have you ever thought about that have, is that something yeah. you guys have considered we, or are you always looking we talk, to about, do we talk a lot about that especially for any of the games that we can control i think uh the first thing we always look at is you know what's the best path to take because the easiest is ultimately just to port the game with the existing visuals and so that's largely what we did with the the shantae one is it's playing the Game Boy Color version, but now it's not playing it on PS5. So that's kind of the easier approach. But then we definitely look at what we can add in terms of uh, value adds and, and new features or new presentation as we go to the the, the new consoles. Um, one example where we, we dipped a toe in some of that was Blood Rain Betrayal. Uh, we ported that to modern consoles, um, did kind of a nice up pass on all the art, so it got much crisper much clearer and then we also uh added um vo for the first time because we never had that in the original game even though the blood rain series always starred laura bailey troy baker like these super famous voice actors so we were fortunate enough to get them back we already had the story in there but it was just word bubbles and adding them to like add that so we look for things like that whenever we're talking with a publisher about porting them like what sort of features we can add what sort of Mm -hmm. like bonus 
can add, whether we do like a full remaster or not. I mean, one example that we did that was a full remaster like that was Mighty Switch Force Hyperdrive Edition that started as a pixel handheld game. And then we kept all the code the same and just redrew everything in high resolution. And it came out really cool. I mean, it just it, it plays great, but it looks exactly like a, you know, big 2D HD Disney style animation console game. Um, it's definitely something that that we've considered for more titles, but it's also very expensive and time consuming. So it's always kind of a balance about, you know, do people want a really bigger deep dive on uh, improving an old game or do they just want a brand new game or do they want just the old game and keep it in the integrity of how it was? And we're always kind of balancing all those options. Yeah. That's always the tricky part, right? Is the, how far do you go? without making the, you know, what's seemingly loud minority, just angry. Um, although I think way forward is pretty genuinely loved across the internet. It seems, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, maybe we just follow all the negative people and just see it all the time. But, uh, you know, I, I, I just have been thinking a lot about Shantae recently, not only because you guys just released it on PlayStation, but also because I've been playing it a little bit on Xbox and, uh that first game is so charming but i always i'm the type of person that it laurent laurent always calls me a tinker and if i know something can you know if we can make something more out of what this is then we're going to try to do it because that's just the type of person and and i was thinking a lot about that original shot I, man that'd be so cool if they updated it to like half genie hero or or seven sirens or any like that graphical style with that animation and that fluid movement and yeah we've definitely he, talked about the possibility yeah that'd be cool i will be there I, I day would, one when it comes out someday maybe. i would like to know how do you guys add so much comedy to this gay and not right. just laugh your tail off because your gays are funny with some of the writing like even with river city ransom like i mean river city girls like the comedy is there in the cut scenes and shate even has some funny moments and it's just like how did you guys capture that uh that comedy in the writing process that's, that's this guy right here for oh, uh, yeah. River City Girls and, uh, but you do you do quite a bit too like actually true. james and i have co-written quite a few games as well um yeah and, you know doing new dialogue or improvements on the dialogue but yeah it's just i think what we've found recently is that funny games are very easy to make resonate with fans um you know and they're fun to make they're fun to make yeah and also i think we're getting more and more into doing voiceover uh, working with some of the best actors in the industry, working with Christina V, who is our casting director on all our games. And, you know, it's, it's, to, short answer is no, we, we laugh hysterically. Like, I mean, James and I have been in the booth when we're recording with Christina and the actors and, and they give us a read and we're just cracking up because of the <laughs> delivery of it. So yeah, we, 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 we love the part of the process of it. And, you know, we love getting that kind of like humor in the games. I think it's something that's becoming more and more common in, in way forward games recently, especially. Yeah. Yeah. That's something that's something I as so I play I don't I don't like the super serious games. I don't like the the spooky games. I'm always I'm always into the the good humorous things. And it, it's it's hard it's hard, I feel like, in video games to get that timing too, because it's so interactive and kinetic in, in a lot of ways. Right. And, you know, I, obviously you guys have the. Actually, you know, here, I'll, I'll tell you, Corey, I'll tell you. So two little tidbits that you might like since you mentioned timing. So one with River City Girls, because Masako and Kyoko are the main characters and they're like, you know, stuck at the, 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 the brain, basically. We record the two of them together. So most actors record separate with Kira and Kaylee, who voice them. We record the two actors together so that they have that extra tight banter and that perfect timing between them, um, just because it was so important to them. And then the other one that occurred to me is, is with Cat Girl Without Salad, that you probably know what I'm going to say. Yeah. <laughs> so she's a very kind of like obscure, like, like just idiotic but fun character. So we would do the timing of her VO. The main and then, character Kibaka. Yeah, and then the timing of all the other characters in the game. And then we would shift it slightly. And, and the way we would shift it is we would bring all of her VO like a half a second earlier than the normal timing. And what it ended up doing is one, 
it makes it seem like she's just cutting them off, like she just is immediately talking without interrupts thinking. Interrupts everybody. <laughs> yeah, she interrupts everybody, but then it also adds an extra delay where people are just like kind of stunned with what she said and reacting to her. And so little things like that. Yeah. We're really big on, on the timing and the flow of, of the humor. And then also as we're recording, which are the takes and, and which are the, you know, exact reads, all of that is super, super critical to getting the right humor. I, I love it. I know, yeah. I know, I don't, I don't really understand when, you know, especially with the types of games that you do, why they have, the characters voice the lines separately. Why aren't you together? And I guess it's, I guess it's, you know, it's sound stuff. Obviously I'm not a audio person, but like, you know, somebody hits a, a hits a table or something, or, you know, it, it's just a cleaner sound in general. But like, I just, I was like, man, you can totally just mess something up by not getting it. You know, yeah, the, I think, the joke I doesn't think hit. always the preference. And so I know that like, on major TV series comedies like Simpsons and I think family guy. And I think teen Titans go, I think on a lot of these that really rely on timing, they have the entire cast in the studio. So they really are all ripping, riffing off each other. It's difficult to Mm. do that logistically just because of schedules and because also you're paying the actors for when they're in the studio. So if you have all of them overlapping, suddenly your, your VO budget is, you know, five times, 10 times as Mm. much. Um, so logistically, we're not able to do that most of the time. But with, like I said, the main two uh, actors in River City Girls, that was important enough for the timing that we're like, okay, we always have to record Masako and Kyoko together because otherwise we're just not going to get that cadence where they're going to feel like best friends. And sometimes they are shady. <laughs> yeah. When they are shady and they just disrespect everybody or just don't care, yeah. the game gets literally funny. <laughs> they would do it so quickly and I'd be cracking up. I'm just like, they do not care about this enemy at all. So they would literally be shady. And it's so good. I think that's something that James and I both like doing is yes. like games where when you really think about it, the hero is kind of the villain and they're just like a jerk to everybody, but they're so charming that you, they get away with it. I mean, that's River City yeah. Girls, the Packer Without yeah. Salad. It's, a, it's yeah. something we kind of enjoy. Yeah. <laughs> that's so good. That's so good. I'm that. Mighty so, Milky Way's one. Yes. I, that's incredible. I, I like hearing stories like that. I, I like, I, I really like River City Girls, by the way. I'm a big fan. I, so I have to admit I haven't played the second one yet, but I do love the first game a lot. Uh, awesome. thank you. I'll get I'll get to the second game. I will I promise. Uh, <laughs> come come so, play with me online, Corey. I want to play know. with you. I know, I know. I'm getting there. There's there's a lot. There's a lot going on. Uh, so when you when you guys decide to to approach a new project, wh- how do you how do you take that approach? What do you do? You just like write some ideas down on a napkin and go, Hey, look, here's what, here's my idea for our next game. Like, how do you, how do you guys approach that? And I, I know it's probably different for like a, a license versus a, a proprietary kind of IP, but what do you, what do you guys, how do you guys yeah, approach you, you, your next uh, project? So James is directing something right now. It's not announced, but it's based on a very beloved classic brand. So how do you approach that in terms of yeah, deciding what to do new and original and all that? Sure. Well, I think the, first most important thing is uh, the business side of it. We have to think about what is the the need of the client. Why are they coming to us? What do they, uh, what, what kind of game do they want from us? And that sort of plants the seed from which everything else can sprout, right? So it's like, okay, this is the sort of game that we want to make. This is the, this is the intellectual property. So we'll do a deep dive and research that property. And I'll become an expert on it. I'll learn everything there is to know about it. I'll play every game in the series if I need to. Um, but you know, so many of these, we, we just, they're in our DNA. We just grew up with them. We know them so well. So it's rare that we have to do that. I'll do it for just to keep it fresh in my mind. But from there we start thinking about, okay, um, what, what is the audience we'd like to reach? And, uh, okay. Think about what, what's, uh, resonating with, with this audience and how can we delight and surprise, uh, players? What can we do that'll be unexpected? That's a uh, fresh cutting edge, fun, and, uh, and something that uh, we would just really love to make. These are the factors that when at the outset of a new project that we have to start thinking about. And personally speaking, um, I'm always uh, focused on something about uh, how the game feels. So uh, quite literally, I'm, I'm a huge fan of uh, features like the, uh, the DualSense haptics or like Nintendo Switch HD Rumble. Um, but 
I don't mean always literally, um, just the sensation moment to moment when you're playing the game. So if it's an action platformer, what's going to make this action platformer feel special when a player picks up the controller, manipulates the character around? What is going to be the moment that's like, oh, that feels so good to play when I when I hold the controller in my hands? Um, these are the like, kind of uh, high level thoughts when we're starting something new. And uh, another side of it is designing the world. What kind of uh, environment, what sort of characters do we want players to to become endeared to, just fall in love with and enjoy uh, taking on the persona of? Uh, we want to provide an experience that uh, players will just feel that that fire inside of them when they pick up the controller and control these characters and, and feel connected to uh, this world. Um, so I, I hope that uh, answers the question. I know you have your own philosophies too on these things. Yeah, I, I would say I know one thing that comes from uh, our creative director, Matt Bozon, is that I believe is um, that we make the game that people, when we're breaking, basing it off of a pre-existing game or a retro game, make the game that they remember playing, not the one that they literally played. Because if you look at some of the older games, they haven't always aged well. Maybe the level design was a little wonky or the play mechanics. But in your mind, it's like, oh, it was this perfect game. And I remember this amazing part. So a lot of it is like, you know, trying to realize that kind of nostalgia and, and you know those rose tinted glasses version of a game and and that'll often kind of temper when we remake something or when we revisit a brand how much we carry over versus how much we start from scratch or we rethink oh my goodness that that speaks to me because there are many game games in the um n64 and game boy days that i just had such fond memories for and then like when I reboot it and I play it, I'm like, my smile like just wants to fracture. I'm like, I still love it, right? I still love it, right? But this camera angle's killing me. So it's almost like you guys are trying to ensure like the, the same similar warm and fuzzy experience, but maybe adapt the game to more modernized controls or just yeah. the, 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 what do you, like? oh my gosh, I need coffee. What's it? Life improvement or yeah, yeah, quality, quality of life. life. Quality of yeah, life. yeah. yeah. And, and like DuckTales was a perfect example of that. It was like looking at the levels, looking at where, like I think, for example, like the minecart sequence was really short in the NES one. And we made it like, you know, have more jumps and crazy spins and stuff because it's like, well, if we're going to do a minecart, you want to make something that feels more like a roller coaster. And then the cool mm -hmm. thing with that game, of course, was being able to combine the NES Capcom games with the DuckTales cartoon and working with the voice actors. Like I believe, I think we were the last DuckTales product that got the original actors for Scrooge and Magicka. Some of these actors that were in their nineties when they recorded with us, it was off awesome to get them back and, and do one more version of DuckTales and have a VR game. That's, that's so good, man. DuckTales. When I was, when I was younger, DuckTales was my jam. And then when you guys remade, where when you guys remade that game, it was like I was, it was awesome. I, I think that's maybe one of my favorite <laughs> wave forward games. To be and honest, yeah, my my awesome. question to you, my question to you guys is, what happened to Rescue Rangers in the S games? Like, <laughs> where's yeah, the remake? The these... <laughs> oh, because after playing, these... we Go would ahead, love. To, yeah, we we would love to do that. We'd love to do Ducktales two. Um, there's so many good games based on that stretch of Capcom Disney titles. We we would love to remake yeah. all of them, hopefully someday. Just don't do your noise. <laughs> you can leave that Domino's game <laughs> somewhere. Just don't do that. All right. Get get John Drake on the phone. He's he's running Disney now, right? The Disney game stuff. So uh yeah, he's handed look, he handed Indiana Jones out to, to Xbox. He can We've got some really good that. Disney contacts. We're we're always talking about stuff. Yes. For the record, yes. I'll do you annoyed if the Domino's hooks us up with yep. free pizza, though. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. It's so cool. That would be a good anniversary game for oh, Domino's no. that they came to you guys. <laughs> it just did. Like, you get a five-level, like, EP demo or whatever. Uh, and you buy, like, two medium pieces or something. And I would be like, oh, that's cool. They gave you a download code, and you guys developed it. it I, I would... I, I would eat so much I, pizza. I probably would too. <laughs> um, let's see. We're so we are we're appro we're approaching the top of the hour, as they would say in radio, I guess. Uh, so when you guys are tackling a project, 
and you guys hit like a like how do you guys work around i guess the speed bump in development or you know say somebody maybe somebody during development leaves and that person was very important how do you how do you guys like adjust your adjust your development because that's you know sometimes people leave that are super important in the project or you know some more than others but uh i mean obviously you guys are still here but it, it it's I bet it's tough when your team changes like that when there's somebody that's super important that goes sure. on to do something else. Yeah, th- you know, things happen during the course of development. You know, th- uh, people people leave. There's an emergency. They, you know, they they get another job somewhere. You know, it, it, these things happen, right? Um, but I think the important thing to remember is that um, communication solves so many issues, right? So um, when road bumps happen, wh- whatever they may be. Um, we tend to uh, regroup, discuss as a team, okay, like who can uh, take on or fulfill this role or this position, or maybe it's a role we didn't know we needed at the outset of development. It's like, oh, we need a, a, like a storyboard artist. It's like, oh, okay, well, we should find someone for that. You know, um, it's, it's really about communication. That's how we problem solve it. We, we get the team together, all the different department heads as necessary. We talk it out, we find what need is, and we discuss a game plan how to solve it. And I mean, that's really all you can do. You know, things happen during development, but we we got to stay on our toes and do the best we can. And speaking yeah. of team members, James, how old were you? So two of our most valuable programmers, uh, <laughs> Maddie and Matthew, how old were you when you first met them? Um, <laughs> I was 13 years old. So uh, yeah, uh, Matthew Greenfield, uh, the um, program that we've worked with on so many games, including... Uh, he single-handedly programmed the game Cat, Cat Girl Without Salad Amuse Bush, and uh, he was a program on many games. We worked on Advanced Wars, uh, One Plus Two Reboot Camp. Um, we worked together. Uh, gosh, I, I, I couldn't even start to list them. But um, we've known each other since I was 13 years old, and I think he was like 9 or 10 years old. <laughs> and um, <laughs> we've been making games together ever since then. Uh, we were uh, uh-huh. operating on, like, projects before I worked at WayForward together remotely, just over the internet. We'd never met each other in person for years and years. And then um, one day uh, before Cat Girl Without Sally came out, I was like, hey, you know, we should uh, we should work together on this game. Uh, and we should like get you here at the studio. We, we flew him out. I got to meet him for the first time, even though I'd known him for well over a decade at that point. And um, yeah, he's, he's one of our rock star programmers to, to this day. So it's kind of incredible. And, and then uh, Maddie Lim, she was a childhood friend, met around the same time. Uh, I, I was 13 years old. We were all on this like same like web forum. And um, she's uh, done some audio programming for us. But uh, she's one of our most talented uh, musicians. Um, the music for Advanced Wars 1 Plus 2 Reboot Camp, uh, music on Vitamin Connection, um, was even involved in uh, Shantae and the Seven Sirens. Um, these people uh, are so near and dear and valuable to us, and it's like uh, we have a, we have great teams, and it's, it's almost like family. I know it's a very cliche thing to say, but it, it's so true. That's yeah, that's that's so cool when you can like that's man that makes that makes the story of way forward even cooler when you know like you guys known each other like growing up, and then you now all work together doing the thing that you love. That's so that's so awesome. Um, <laughs> So I have I have a couple questions that I kind of want to ask. So is there are there any? Uh, actually, I think this one was from Ed. Is there is there a genre of game that you guys haven't worked on that you would like to work on? I'll let you go first. Uh, yeah. I mean, we we try and do a little bit of everything. I think. Um, one genre that we're interested in that I don't think we've worked in yet is we call it arena brawler. So if you think of power stone or cannon spike, like Ooh. little 3d, you know, small arena, beat the crap out of each other, like types of games. That's a genre. I think that would be really cool for us to work in. And we've definitely looked for opportunities for that. How about you? Personally, I'm really uh, enthusiastic. Dare I say obsessed with the genre of rhythm games. Uh, uh-huh. I love any sort of music game. Uh, I grew up playing games like Parappa the Rapper, um, Buster Groove. Um, I love Dance Dance Revolution to this day, Beat Mania. Um, 
And one of my favorite no, uh, Nintendo <laughs> games is uh, Rhythm Heaven. So I was about to I say, what about? I was about to say, what about Elite B Agents? Oh, I love Papake, <laughs> oh, and Don, and of course, Elite yes. B Agents. Those are some absolute favorites of mine. Uh, people in this are incredible for those games. I uh, I played the heck out of uh, Owen Don 1, 2, and EBA, yes. Yeah. We uh, are, so our Nintendo podcast, Nintendo Power Block, we lovingly call the followers of that show Elite Block Agents because, nice. because, of, <laughs> because of Ed. So, Perfect. Uh, um, so I know you, I know you just did uh, Advance Wars, but I would personally like to see a way forward IP tactics game. That, that I personally, no, as somebody I, who really yeah. likes tactics games. Yeah, I, I would be really nice. I mean, I, I love, I was huge into the Metal Gear Portable Ops games. We were really big into Final Fantasy Tactics. Oh, I love the yeah. GBA version. Um, you know, like obviously Advance Wars is kind of in the same realm of that. So, yeah, I, I, I think that would work really well, especially because when you have those kind of games, um, they often rely on like having very tight but rigid kind of like basic gameplay mechanics and then just tons mm-hmm. of personality on top of it. And I think that's one area where Way Forward does a good job is having something where the has good gameplay fundamentals, but then a nice kind of like flow and polish on top of it. So I would love to see us do something more straight up tactics like Final Fantasy Tactics. That'd be really fun. Yeah, I, I, uh, I grew up playing uh, Final Fantasy Tactics. There's a PlayStation game called Cartia. Uh, with Yoshitaka Amano art. It was an incredible game. Not That one's not super well-known, but I, an incredible uh, tactics game. And, of course, you know, working on Advance Wars, it uh, kind of uh, re-engaged my appetite for that genre of game and got my head really in the design nuts and bolts of how to build that style of game. So, uh, personally, Corey, I'd be really excited to do that, too. I would love to see you guys uh, take Arch Rivals and do, like, something somewhat like NBA Jam, but make it, like... Probably just funny. I mean, you don't have to do the punch and, and, or anything, but just to see like the crowd throwing power ups or throwing stuff from other gangs to trip them up. Like, I, I would love to see that. Uh, like, because I don't think you guys have ever did a actual arcade sports game like uh NBA Jam or uh, what was the football one that Midway did? Blitz. Um, Blitz. Blitz. Yeah. yeah. Um, I haven't seen you guys do anything of that, so. I no, think that no, would be something that many sports games. I mean, we definitely like after River City Girls, we've talked about it because half the Kunio Kun games are sports, you know, dodgeball, dodgeball. Mm-hmm. soccer, and hockey, and all that. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that would be cool. I, and then also just talking about strategy, um, we did have one earlier one that's worth checking out if you have a 3DS. We did a Transformers game, Rise of the Dark, um, Spark. Rise of the Dark Spark, and that's a really interesting way forward one. So, it's got like a top down strategy pixel based kind of like a, a game but then when you get pulled into the battle it's all mm-hmm. polygonal and i remember it came out right after uh pacific rim so we were very influenced by like the c- cinematography in uh in that movie and it, it's a cool blend of everything at way forward so you get this really nice overworld pixel strategy mode and then when you get together you're kind of basically you know rock em sock with polygonal 3d robots with like meter fills and stuff and that's that's a pure on strategy game that we did that was pretty fun nice oh, man now i'm just thinking about all the tech so i i mean i imagine if you technically did a tactics game with way forward ip I, I mean i'm sure there's a lot of a lot of licensing involved with the various people but they, they'll be on board right i mean they'll, they'll be fine with it just you only hope so <laughs> Yeah, just be Come like, no, we're using we're using River City Girls. We're gonna we're gonna pull in the the military guy from the Mummy. Uh, we're gonna you know obviously we're gonna use Shantae and Mighty Switch Force. It'll be fine. Oh, Ducktails, oh, Scrooge McDuck. It's fine. N- Nitty, I need <laughs> oh you to Nitty, I need you to give way for a code name, Steve. Just oh yeah. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I'm, I'm just I'm just putting it out in the atmosphere. I'm not saying this happening or anything, so, but Nitsy, yeah, no. come on. <laughs> okay, James, so James and, I, James and I were at the world reveal premiere. The reveal of Codename yeah. Steam. We were in the audience when they revealed that to the world for the first time. At E3. Still remember that yeah. at E3. Yeah. We sat through uh, we sat in, I should say, a almost two hour presentation about Codename Steam with the uh 
I guess the team behind the game. Yeah, and that was the same one where they announced Pac-Man for Smash Brothers, right? That was, uh, was that the one? year before oh, the roundtable okay. discussion where they revealed. Yeah. We were in that as well, same theater. Yeah. They were Pac-Man uh, reveal in Smash Brothers, and I think you can hear like my voice go, "Yeah!" in the soundbite <laughs> like with the Pac-Man reveal. <laughs> <laughs> You know, we, we had the opportunity to ask Masahiro Sakurai uh, some questions during that, and it was pretty interesting. Um, but Adam almost mortified uh, the, the both of us. Well, he no, he mortified me. I, 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 I <laughs> joked. I told him I was going to ask about Shrek, but that was a joke. Um, oh, James, wow. actually, you won, what was it? You won a gold medal for Smash Brothers at E3 or something? Yeah, I won the E3 tournament for Super Smash Brothers. Uh for Wii U, yeah, and uh, I got the awesome. I got the, the gold medal. <laughs> that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> oh man, that's so. You guys are so cool. When it, uh, it, it's, <laughs> oh, because you said Smash for Wii U, I only could play that game with the 3DS. I can't play it with Ed. the gamepad. No, no, you're the worst. Said everybody. <laughs> it, it, for some reason, for some reason, the 3DS felt so good uh, playing it on the Wii U version. Uh, to who? Two. Zero. 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 This is my main. That's my girl. Who, who's your main? Z, uh, Zero suit Samus. Zero suit Samus. Excellent choice. Uh, I'm I'm a Kirby guy myself. Kirby, nice. I'm a K, I'm a King DDD guy myself, only because oh, I think it's so. Excellent. I think it's so ridiculous that a giant penguin wields a hammer, and it's just funny when you s- smack people off the stage with it. Formidable oh. opponent. Yeah, you know, I'm not say... very good. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, finish. Steph. No, you finish. Uh, I was just gonna say I'm not very good at Smash at all, but I like to play King Dedede just to disrupt the. You know, sometimes you get the the people in there that are so serious that they know how everybody's gonna play because everybody yeah. has the same strategy, and then you just throw a wrench in there like a terrible King Dedede player. You're the wild they don't, card. They don't, yeah, they don't know what to do. Yeah. And that's that's your advantage. So I think I, I like Solid Snake for the same reason. When you start, you know, firing mortars and like you know flying away, he has some really weird oddball attacks that make him unpredictable. Mm. For me, I've been kind of boring. I've been sticking with Pikachu since um, Super Smash Bros. Like uh, Super Smash Brothers sixty four. It's just oh, Pikachu's nice. a great fighter. Mm-hmm. That that uh, up special is a uh, force to be reckoned with. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Smash Brothers, what a game! Uh, so just kind of, I guess to t- to tie this off, what what's the what's the proudest you've been in your careers? What's the proudest moment you guys have had in your careers? Oh gosh, I I mean, I'm just proud every day I get to work with uh, the teams I get to work with, making making games with awesome people. We we have so much fun, you know. There's a speak of Masahiro Sakurai. Right? One of his quotes is that. Uh, Something to uh, the extent of um, if we're creating fun, then we have to have fun in the process, that sort of thing. Um, and we just love making games. So I'm always proud uh, of the things that we create, uh, no matter what it is, just working with great people every day fills me with pride. Um, yeah, and I, I think, especially now that I'm getting more into the biz dev side, I love getting opportunities that get our directors like James excited. So like, you know, finding out what is their favorite anime of all time? What is their favorite NES game of all time or their favorite childhood toy of all time? And then reaching out and talking to everybody about, you know, who has the rights, who's willing to fund it, who wants to publish it. And, you know, a lot of our games that we're working on right now that'll come out in 2024, 2025 and beyond are really based on kind of like dream brands that, that we never, you know, 10 years ago thought we would ever have access to. So that's one of my most exciting things is, you know, going after those dream brands and, and getting everybody, whether it's in U S Europe, Japan, everywhere that has a stake in it to say, yes, we believe in way forward's vision and, and you guys can, can play in our sandbox. So, so what I hear is you're going to make, you're going to make a GI Joe game. You're going to make a, a TMNT game. I oh. look, look, dot, dot <laughs> music was good, but look, I have faith that way forward could do a really awesome, like I, I almost envision it in the style of like the, like the, sh- the Shantae games where it's like the, you know, the, the thick black outlines, very colorful, very just, or, you know, you could very well do like, like a comic book style, like the old school comics, like the original run comics, a very 
dark, whatever. Uh, you're gonna make a you're gonna make a Mighty Morphin Power Rangers game. You're gonna make, uh, <laughs> no, I'm just it's time for up, it's time for way for it to touch Ducky Kong Country. It's time oh. for y'all to. <laughs> I'm just saying. You know, there's just so many uh, intellectual properties we'd love to uh, to play with and get our hands on and design things around. <laughs> The, the list is practically endless. Uh, the things that we've talked about wanting to do, the things we've pursued doing, the the um, you know the documents we put together with proposals, uh, or just the things that we think about. The things that are right. signed right now, and the, that we're working, and on. the things we're working on right now are included. Yeah, uh, Jays, I, I, I kind of got two questions for you. One, one of them: Can you make Jim <laughs> the the get the uh, cartoon Jim? Jim and the Hologram. Make- Yes. Could yeah. that be your music genre game from Way For? I, I was free. Yeah, that would be amazing. Oh, please, by all means. Yeah, our our, our friend uh, uh, Lindsay, who was the lead artist on Vitacon and, and Cat Girl, is a huge gem fan. And for her birthday one year, a number of years back, I tracked down the original voice actor for uh, uh, Pizzazz and got her to like do an in character, like, you know, kind of like. Nasty put down birthday birthday message. message. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're uh, well, uh, my my final question for you uh, before we let you go, uh, you all work hard to make players smile, and I wonder, regardless of reviews, do you all smile along with us when you see gamers post show work? Of course, yes. It's a it's a great honor to uh, see our games really well received, and uh, th- you know it. And it comes down to the reason that we are in this business and the reason we do this. I create video games and so many people on our team create video games and Adam, we create video games. We're entertainers. We want to delight people. We want to uh, bring people together. You know, it's uh, game designers, maybe like at the surface level, not the most noble like job in the world next to, you know, doctors like save lives. Um, But just the same, we want to enrich people's lives. We want to just delight and make people smile. And uh, when, we know we've done a job well done and people are smiling because of something we created. Of course. Yes. We smile too. Yeah. We definitely pay attention. Um, I mean, especially with the games that tend to get played for longer periods of time, like the river city games and the Shantae games. Um, we're constantly hopping into the Twitch streams, looking at the YouTube streams. So, you know, watching people play our games and also pulling information from that. Like what do people really like? What do they dislike? Uh, which of our games resonate, all of that feeds back into, you know, helping us make better and better games in the future. Okay. Stephanie, you yeah, got I, anything? You wanna... <laughs> oh, sorry, Ed. Oh, no. I, I was just saying, I think that's why I, I'm a big supporter of your games, because I, I just feel like you guys make games for anybody, everybody, and they're just so fun to play. You know, there's something about it that just makes you feel like, yeah, it is a video game, but it's something that makes you feel good that you own it and that you're playing it. Thank you. Stephanie, you have any uh, final questions or final words for them before we uh, let them go? Um, Not questions, but, you know, thank you for, you know, well, I mean, to everybody here having me on, I know uh, Corey extended the invitation and, it's nice to see you again. Nice to get get to know more about Way Forward. I I really appreciate you know, your company's philosophy. Um, it's really honorable. I know that might sound pretty cheesy, but I have a lot of respect um, for companies and for those that work for companies like that. So it's just kind of you know, other than Lunark, which I'm I'm looking forward to playing. You know, you guys are kind of up there on my radar, and I want to be able to spread the word. Uh, even more so about you guys. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Yeah, and, and thank you for mentioning Lunark. So Lunark was a game that it was developed externally, but we just loved it, and we said we have to publish this game. We knew the developer, Johan Vanette. So definitely, if anybody's interested in seeing a really cool retro cinematic platformer by Way Forward, look up Lunark. It just came out. It's L-U-N-A-R-K. Okay. It's a different style for our kind of games, but... Um, we're really trying to get it out there and get as many people aware of that as possible. I bought it twice. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, you just I, have to one up everybody, Corey. Go no, on. I don't. I, no. So, okay. So no, here's the thing. Here's, here's, here's my last thing. 
I said I second everything Stephanie said. I'm also my primary platform mostly for games is Xbox. And so I originally bought Lunark on Switch, right? Because why not? Indie games are great on Switch. I want to play in bed, whatever. But I know a lot of especially smaller developers and publishers a lot of the time sometimes skip Xbox or they're waiting for that Game Pass deal or they're, you know, it seems to seems to be that's what where that side of the industry is going. And I just wanted to show my support for the game on Xbox to say that we want these games on Xbox because it's not it's not all about Halo and Call of Duty and Gears and, mm-hmm. you know, stuff like that. I, I love playing indies on on Xbox. And like I said, that's where I'm playing Shantae right now. Uh, I've discovered a lot of I have discovered a lot of indies through Game Pass. But like my thing is, if I I think these games should be here and you know, Adam, when we had you on the last time, uh, just repeating what Stephanie said, I really appreciate you guys being uh, a, a great studio, uh, having the philosophy you have. And, you know, again, <laughs> for some reason, it's very hard for people to just be nice people. <laughs> and but so to communicate uh, again, it just yeah. seems like such a simple, simple concept, but it's. Yeah. So uh, I, I appreciate you guys taking the time uh, tonight to, to record with us. I appreciate what your studio is and stands for. And I look forward to more way forward. Uh, so just to kind of wrap it up, uh, you want to tell people where they can go to find more about your games, where they can find you guys if you want, uh, what games they can either buy now or look forward to in the future, uh, stuff like that. Yeah, I think if you just go to wayforward.com, W-A-Y-F-O-R-W-A-R-D.com, um, that has links to most of our currently available games. If you're a PC gamer, just type Way Forward into the search box. You'll get the whole list of everything we have currently available on Steam PC. And uh, yeah, it's, it's quite a bit. We've you know we've been developing for over 30 years, long before either of us got here. We've been publishing for about 15 years and uh and it's we've got some really good titles out right now so you know now's a good time to to kind of you know look into what way forward's doing both in terms of original brands and in terms of licensed stuff and like i mentioned the stuff that we've got coming out over the next two years is probably some of the best games we've ever done so hopefully we we keep building up our fan base and and make the kind of games that you guys want to see from us and you can follow us on twitter at way forward yep and um, you can follow me personally on Twitter at James Popstar, and I'd be delighted to hear from you if you've enjoyed our games. That's James P O P S T A R. Say hello to me. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you again for for joining us tonight. This was this was awesome. Uh, I'm I'm glad you could join us on this first run of of developer spotlights. Uh, you guys are going to be one of the <laughs> one of the first ones out. So I'm very. I'm very excited that you guys are kind of kicking this off for us. Oh, uh, it's been a real, it's been a real pleasure. Uh, I want to thank everybody out there for watching and or listening. Uh, you can find all of our content on bossrush.net. You can subscribe to us on YouTube, on your favorite podcast app. Uh, if you want this show a week early, you can go to patreoncom slash Uh This episode is going to be free for everybody uh, to listen to, obviously. Uh, so check it out. I want to thank everybody for watching and or listening. And until next time, we love you. Goodbye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. The Boss Rush Podcast is a product of Boss Rush Media, LLC, and is recorded from our headquarters in Akron, Ohio. This show is produced, written, and directed by me, Corey Dierig. My co-hosts are Stephanie Klimov, Laurent Dawkins, and Edward Barnell. You can find Stephanie at Klimov underscore author on Twitter and Instagram, as well as on the EXP cast. You can find Leron at Exodus803 on Twitter, Instagram, Twitch, and YouTube, and also on Crossroads, the video game podcast. You can find Edward at that retro code on Twitter and Instagram, as well as hosting Nintendo Power Block. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at I am Corey and HD, and find me hosting Tower Casuals, the Destiny podcast, and co-hosting Nintendo Power Block. Find the Boss Rush podcast on all social media platforms at Boss Rush Podcast. You can also follow Boss Rush Media and Boss Rush Network on all major social media platforms. Join the Boss Rush Network Discord and Facebook groups to interact with other friends and fans. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.